Hello, everybody. Hope you are able to hear me, see me. It appears that the live stream is working on Facebook. However, on YouTube, it does not appear to be connecting. <laughs> Technology frustration. Oh, well. Um, so if you are able to see or hear me on YouTube, check us out on Facebook. All right. So first, glad that you are all here. I'm Tom Hess. Uh, for those who don't know me, uh, this is Guitar Mastery Talk. And today we have a very special guest. We're going to be talking about why music theory is not that hard to learn. All right. And uh, I'll be speaking today with a very special guest, as I mentioned. He's one of the very smartest people I know. Uh, he's earned his PhD many years ago now. Uh, he's become somewhat of a celebrity. And he is the leading authority on music theory for guitar. He's a certified elite guitar teacher. He's earned the prestigious Guitar Teacher of the Year Award. And of course, I am talking about Dr. Tommaso Zilio. Welcome, Dr. Zilio. Hello, Internet. So nice to see you. And hi, Tomas. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> How's it going today? Uh, going very well, having a little bit of an issue with streaming on YouTube, apparently. But uh, other than that, it's going quite well. So, Good. Dr. Zilio, maybe if you can mute yourself uh, for a moment, because we got an echo here. Um, I wanted to talk, uh, on the, as you know, about the topic, why music theory is not really hard to learn. Now, you've taught music theory for guitar to guitar students from all over the place different ages, different styles of music, all over the world. And uh, you've taught a lot of people. And uh, I'm sure you've heard many people say that music theory is hard to learn. It's confusing. They've told you how they've tried to learn music theory in the past, and they got all confused, and they're all frustrated, and they don't understand, and it's really hard, and it can't be done. OK, so before we talk about why music theory is actually not that hard to learn. Let's talk about why so many people think that it is hard to learn. And uh, maybe if you want to share your thoughts on that. Well, the thing is, music theory, like you say, it's not really hard to learn, but it definitely gives the impression that it's hard to learn. And the, there are several little things that when we add all of them together makes this idea of learning music theory really hard. The first one is that music theory has been taught in academia, so at the university, for a long, long time. As you know, I come from academia. Previously, I was working in a university. And one thing I've noticed, there are many good things about academia. I don't want to go and say everything is wrong and all this kind of thing. But one thing that mm, academia tends to do to those disciplines is that they put a, la a layer of jargon on top of it. So there are ideas and concepts in music theory that are objectively very, very simple. OK, chords are not hard. Um, scales, keys are not hard. In and the more we go ahead, even some chord progression are not hard. But when you are saddled with names like uh, um, chromatic mediant progression, augmented sixth, and all these kind of things, it starts to feel like the whole thing, it's really, really hard. We have all those long uh, polysyllabic words. And after a while, you hear people about talking about Phrygian dominant scales and all the names of the modes which are, which are in Greek and why the name of the modes are in Greek anyway, and all these kind of things. The whole thing looks very hard. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that when people explain music theory, they expect you to know some music theory already, which makes no sense. It's kind of like when you're searching for a job, OK? And they interview you for a job, and they ask you, what's your previous experience? And if you have no previous experience, they don't give you the job. But if you don't, they don't give you the job, how can you get previous experience and all these kind of things? <laughs> In music theory, it's exactly the same. The, every book you get, every resource you get, they expect you to know something already. They expect you to know uh, for at least the notes or the chords or how to find those things on the guitar. And then they start building on that, but not Everybody knows these already. 
And even if you've learned this already, maybe on the internet, you may have some missing pieces here and there because there are no complete resources. There are very few complete resources that starts from zero. So those little missing pieces here and there uh, makes you confused because you are not confident about knowing all these. You're not sure you understand the explanation and all these. So it's it's interesting, essentially, that, that this happens. Uh, but that's definitely one of the problems about learning music theory. And then there is another thing going on, which is people don't even agree about all that. There are different schools of music theory. Some of those are legit schools, meaning there are people who have legit difference of opinion on how to understand music theory. Um, the classic thing is Hugo Riemann versus uh, um, uh, Schenkerian analysis, okay, which are two completely different ways of seeing music theory. I'm not going getting into that, but uh, today we are mostly taught the Hugo Riemann idea and not so much the Schenker idea. Um, I think they're both good ideas, honestly, and two different ways of seeing music theory. Um, and that's, a, that's a genuine difference of how to understand music, and it's interesting to see that. And then there are the not so genuine difference. So. I have this story. Once I posted a video about chord symbols, okay, you know, C major, D minor, and um, I I posted that you can write a C major seven, the chord C major seven, in at least two different ways. Actually, I found the sources for around fourteen different ways of writing the same chord, which is crazy. But the two main ways are C M A J seven and C triangle. So you put a triangle in the symbol. This video, I posted this video on Facebook and then in the in the comment section uh, started a, a whole flame war started about two people, one saying that the C triangle was completely wrong and only ignorant people use, uses it, and the other person say that C triangle was invented by John Coltrane. I don't know if it's true, it could be. And um, and so it was a legit way of writing chords. And these guys went on and on and on and on. And what transpired at the end, what, what happened at the end is that those two people were both music theory professors at two different universities, one on the East Coast and one on the West Coast. And apparently, university in the East Coast and university in the West Coast of US use two different systems of notation, or at least that's what I understood so far. If we can't even agree on how to notate chords, or if we can't even be tolerant, in a sense, on how other people notate chords, because, I mean, it's not really hard to learn a couple more symbols if people want to notate it differently, but if we can even agree there on, on that, we are not even arriving at the actual ideas of music theory. We are still discussing about how to call all those things. And that's why people think music theory is hard. It's just front-loaded with all those kind of problems, when in reality, it's actually a pretty simple thing. Guys, it's making music, okay? It's, we're not talking about rocket science here. So, yeah. yeah, I agree with that. And, you know, music theory has, as you know, has evolved over hundreds of years, and there have been many different approaches to teaching it. And I think we're going to get to, maybe a little bit later, we'll, we'll talk about another aspect of why it, it is confusing or it gets confusing uh, for people. So, what about the people who think that music theory is a set of rules to follow and therefore music theory restricts their creativity somehow? What would you say, uh, to, and I know you have said it <laughs> to people who do think this way, what, what would you say to people watching now who, who have that concern or have at least heard this before? Well, Music theory, I'll start with the statement, music theory is really not a set of rules. Music theory can be formalized as a set of rules, that's for sure. Some people do that. I really don't like the approach, okay? Um, it really depends on how you use music theory, because music theory can be used in many different ways. And in the past, some people used music theory to um, decide if a piece of music was 
good or bad or better or worse and all this kind of thing, which I think is really not a good idea. I think to understand if a music, if a piece of music is good or not, you should listen to it. Really, <laughs> you should not use theory. Um, but apparently, some people want to have an objective. Um, a uh, way of saying if a piece is good or not, and they want to do this through theoretical analysis. Again, it's possible, yes. I'm not going to rain on their party, okay? If they want to do it, they can do it. That's not a problem. But I don't think it's a good approach for a musician. It's a good approach for a critic, maybe, but not for a musician. For us musicians, music theory is essentially a vocabulary it's a, of everything it has done before us. Okay, you know the old thing like if you don't know your history, you are condemned to repeat it. If you don't know music theory, you are condemned to rediscover it. Okay, um, a number of people told me that if they learn music theory, their creativity is gonna be restricted, and I can see how it feels that way. Again, the way music theory is taught out there by several different people, or at university or a jazz college, etc., it looks this way. They tell you. That's how you make music. After this chord comes this other chord, or this other chord, and after this chord comes this other chord, which again I think it's really not true. You can find exceptions everywhere, okay? And some people have this feeling like, no, if I learn music theory, then I'm gonna box. I'm gonna be boxed in this little thing. I'm never gonna be able to get out of this. In reality, if music theory is taught properly, and that's the thing. Music theory gives you a number of options. Okay, you can learn what Mozart was thinking. You can learn what Beethoven was thinking. You can learn what John Coltrane was thinking. You can you can try and understand how those people approach music. What was their ideas in making music? What what was their goal in making music? And then you, if you want, and only if you want, you can try to do the same thing as they were doing. If you want to write like Mozart today, so in the style of Mozart, you can. I'm not saying you should, but if you want, you can. And even if you don't want, by studying what Mozart was doing and why, from a composer point of view, not from an analysis point of view, then you can use some of those ideas in your music. If you don't do that, you are condemned to rediscover the whole thing. What I see that people who don't study music theory tend to write pretty much the same kind of music. And the ironic thing, and again, I don't, I don't want to condemn anybody here, but the ironic thing is that they write the kind, uh, the kind of music that they can write with the music theory they know. Because when they tell me, I know my chords, or I compose this, this music and there are chords inside, chords are music theory. It are a little part of music theory, triads, major, G major, E minor, all this kind of thing, are a little part of music theory that they absorbed just by looking at other people in a approximate way, let's say, let's say. And then they try to put those things together and they make songs. They are still using music theory. Those chords are music theory. Where do you think they come from? Chords are not natural. Chords were invented. We have the date. <laughs> I mean, chords were invented in a book by Jean-Philippe Rameau. Okay. Something similar existed before, but Jean-Philippe Rameau was the first one to identify chords as chords and do specific operation on them, like inversion and, the, and progressions and all these kind of things. They were invented they, or discovered, as some people prefer to say. I really don't know. And in, in this case, it's it's what you want, depending on your philosophical outlook. But this is theory. And if nobody taught, showed those people, those composers who don't want to learn music theory, nobody showed them chords, they would not be writing music that way. So they are influenced by music theory, they don't even know, and they are actually in a box because that's the only thing they can do. They really cannot be free because that's the only thing they know. And learning music theory the right way, you learn to be free to get more options than this. There is much more to music than chords, especially if we're thinking only about major and minor triads. There's so much more that it's not even funny, okay? So, um, and again, those are not rules. It's like, hey, this is another way of making a chord. It works well with those things. Do you like the sound? Yes, use it. Do you don't, you don't like the sound? Okay, don't use it. There's another one here, and there's another one, and there's another one. Or we cannot use a chord, or we can think in a, about music in a different way. 
People were writing music without chords for the longest time. Bach never, Johann Sebastian Bach never thought in terms of chords. For, for, how, for everything he was concerned, he never wrote a chord. He never thought about a chord. And when Jean-Philippe Rameau came out with the idea of chords, Bach and one of his sons wrote a book against that, saying specifically, we don't think about chords. We think it's counterproductive, which is very funny since now today everybody thinks about chords. <laughs> okay, so that's the thing. We can learn completely different alien up to us approach to music and we can make new music that sounds different and still sounds good. Okay, because that's the thing is people think if I, if I break the rule, I start to sound like ca cats on pianos. You don't have to, if you want, you can, but you don't have to sound like cats on pianos. There's lots of good music that breaks what you think are the rules. But that's the idea. There are no rules that never were. And if you open a music theory book and you start to finding rules like uh, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this, some music theory books are written this way. Those are the rules for that specific exercise, not for music in general. That's what other people don't understand. They read the first chapter of the book and like, no, it's full of rules. I don't want to do it. Those are the rules for that specific exercise because they want you to train on that. Okay. And it's, it's like going to the gym and they see people bench pressing and you're thinking, no, I don't want to do my pecs. I'm going to go somewhere else. Yeah. You just seen one person exercise on one, on one, um, in, in, in one way, stay there for a few more minutes and see other people exercising in a different way. And then you can have an idea. Okay, not everything is bench pressing and not everything is chords. Exactly. Great, great points there. And uh, interesting thing that you uh, mentioned, uh, the, the history of uh, where chords came from with Rameau. And, you know, prior to that, composed Bach being the, the biggest figure of the time, but Bach and everybody prior to Bach and even some people after, they really thought of music as multiple melodies. In fact, music was called polyphony, polyphonic music. And there were multiple melodies happening simultaneously. And Rameau came to analyze a snapshot of each of these moments, how all of the multiple melodies line up. And this concept, this entity, this snapshot entity is what became the chord. And in the beginning, people weren't sure what do you do when you have a, a first inversion triad? If you've got A minor with C in the bass, is that some kind of a C chord? Is that A minor? What is it? So, you know, the, the concept of chord and then inversions, working out the inversions that no, A minor with C in the bass is really still A minor. It's not some other type of C chord. So it's just interesting, the concept there. And one of the things that I just comment, I know we're getting a little bit off topic, but I'm so interested in the, the history of this as well. When Rameau came and developed the concept of, of chords and, you know, some uh, vertical uh, sonorities, you know, which is basically what a chord is. What Bach's point was when he was saying that we don't think about chords and, you know, he was against this concept because what he was concerned, and I think he was, was right in this, is that what would be lost, and for many people what had been lost, is the concept of horizontal line, that counterpoint and how lines and melodies move together in the interplay in the various motions, a lot of that was lost. In fact, after the Baroque era, which basically ends when Bach dies, um, we, had, we move into the classical era and counterpoint was much less significant, it still existed, but it was much less significant and important in that era the era that followed uh, the Baroque era compared to all the eras that preceded it. Um, because again, they're thinking harmony, melody on top, chord, melody on top. And I think today a lot, of course we benefit from Rameau's work and the, the evolution of music theory from that point on, thinking about chords and seeing harmony and thinking about much of music theory is about chords and harmony and, and how those things uh, work together. But a lot of people today, are unaware of the concept of polyphony and how counterpoint really works. So, you know, the bass follows the guitar, the guitar goes up, the bass goes up, the guitar goes down, the bass goes down. And it's often parallel motion, you know, all of the time. Uh, and there has been some loss. I, I think that 
Bach was half right in, in his objection, not to be opposed to chords, but to not want to lose everything else. And, and some of that on people has been lost, uh, hasn't been lost in music theory, but among many songwriters and composers that followed, it was at least partially lost. Uh, anyway, but it doesn't have to be. And music theory can certainly teach one that. One of the other points that you made, and you made well, regarding um, music theory not being a set of rules, not being something that confines you in a box, I found music theory to be a massive liberator. So it liberates, in fact, I think you even used that word, it liberates one from not knowing how things can work. When people think about music theory as a set of rules that tell you what has to be done, otherwise you're somehow violating music theory principle. Well, you may be violating principle that's in music theory, but you're not violating some rule that you must follow. And as you mentioned, the if you opened the took a music theory course and i know you've got a couple or any uh any textbook or something like that when you see a set of guidelines or rules they are exactly what you said there are rules for to understand how this specific thing works so if you want you've made some videos on augmented six chords for example which is a really great example uh there so if someone wants to learn about the doubly augmented six chord or the French or Italian augmented six chord, there are definite specific rules that define, they're not really rules, they're, they're elements that go into defining that this is a chord, this chord of a certain type. And it works this way. It's built this way. It typically resolves this way. You don't have to do this, but if you do something else, that's great, but you're doing now something else and recognizing what those other options are is where the value of music theory really, I think, is there. Um, so I'm glad that you touched on uh, all of that stuff. So now that we've covered a little bit about why people think that music theory is hard to learn um, and why others think that music theory is only a set of restrictive rules, I wanted to ask you why you think that music theory can be ought to be, and certainly can be, easy to learn? And how can someone make music theory easier to learn? What are your thoughts on that? You're, you're muted. Is to make sure that you understand the very basics, okay? What are the notes? What are the notes on the fretboard? And from day number one, try to connect what you learn in music theory to your instrument, to the guitar. If you learn about a chord, you have to find a way to play it on the guitar. If you cannot play the chord on the guitar, you really don't know anything. You have just a name, okay? You don't have music theory in any way. You have just a name and nothing to connect it to. If you don't know the notes on your guitar, it's very hard to learn pretty much anything. Okay, I have a video on my channel on how to learn notes on the guitar. It's not as hard as people think. It just takes five minutes a day. But the first idea is always try to bring everything back to the instrument. Always try to get everything back to the actual sound. Some musicians like a lot to talk about strange names, fringe and dominant and all this kind of thing. Um, okay, but how, how does it sound? That's the important thing. I like to think of music theory as a collection. I mean, it's not really true, but in first approximation, I like to think of music theory as a collection of, hey, that's a nice sound. You do, you like it. If you like it, you make it this way. A collection of this kind of guidelines. You like this, that's how it's done. You like this, that's how it's done. You don't like this, that's how it's done, so don't do that, <laughs> okay? It's, it's good to learn even the stuff you don't like, so you can avoid it, <laughs> okay? You understand why it makes that sound, and then you don't do it anymore, <laughs> okay? People tell me I don't want to learn seventh chords because they sound jazz. Great, so learn them and don't do them anymore. <laughs> okay, it's the best way to not sound jazz, okay? Or maybe you discover that you like them and you can make them sound not jazz, because you can. So you make it easy by connecting it to the instrument. You never let anything to be just 
theory, okay? You learn a scale, play it on the guitar. Maybe you can play it only up and down. Maybe you can play only a few notes of the scale, but you have something. You have something. Theory, I mean, it's called music theory, so I know how this sounds, but I, I would like to call it music practice. <laughs> That's the thing. Er, there is nothing more practical than a good theory because it tells you all the options you have and how people are thinking. And it also tells you how not to think with those people so you can invent more options. Okay. And it's always been used this way, by the way. And the first thing is take it to the instrument or take it to your voice, sing those concepts. Now, I know that whenever, whenever I say sing, we, we lose half the audience. <laughs> go like, no, I don't want to sing. Let's, <laughs> let's close the video. Don't have to sing in front of people. In one of the next video I'm going to put on the, on, on, on my, on my channel, I'm singing and it's going to, it's going to be horrible for all of you. I'm sorry. It's just to show you that. <laughs> okay. You don't have, need to have a good tone of voice. You don't even need to be perfectly in tune. It's just to get the idea. It's just to internalize the concept. Maybe okay. the only thing worse than you singing is me singing. <laughs> <laughs> we should make a contest because I don't think so. <laughs> no, I forfeit. You win. <laughs> yeah, neither you or I are, are, are singers, that's for sure. But we can use our voice to write music, for instance. I mean, we can record in our phones some melodies. We can transcribe them later and then destroy those those files, hide them in the vault, burn the phone so nobody could ever hear, hear them. But yeah, you guys can sing in your shower in front of your guitar, closed in an anechoic chamber so nobody hears it, no problem. But it's good to learn that, okay? And the second thing is to not get frightened by the jargon, by the big words. Connect them again to your instrument. Okay, it's called the um, negative harmony frigid dominant or something like that. Okay, what it means in practice? Usually what it means in practice is something very simple, very, very simple, okay? Uh, and again, music is, is, is full of those things, like augmented six chords. They are really simple. They are really, really simple, okay? It's, or triton substitution. They are really simple. And by the way, they happen to be the same chords as the augmented sixth. Long story there, I have a video on that coming on, on uh, how those two things are actually are pretty much the same thing, even not exactly exactly. But fancy names for simple stuff. Understand what to do, not how they're called. I mean, if you want to understand how they're called, it's, it's good because you, have a, you can communicate with other people, okay? This takes me to another, another thing is when people tell you that um, they don't know music theory, Often they do know music theory. They just don't know the fancy word that go with it. Yeah, they're okay? missing the labels. They're oh. missing the labels. Exactly. They're missing the jargon. Okay. The, the academic veneer on top. Okay. They know exactly what they're doing. They know their course. They know how they progress. They know exactly how, how things sound. They can tell you how the course sounds before they are playing them. They can sing on them and create good melodies. They learn all the functional elements of theory. They didn't learn the names. So of course they tell you that they don't know music theory because if they tell you that they, the new music theory, people will ask them questions and they will be able to even understand the question because they don't know the words, but they can make music. Yeah. And one of the things that uh, when I encounter people this way, I'm going to mute you just to avoid an echo here. One of the things that I notice uh, with people who, exactly like you said, they actually do know at least some music theory, but because they never learned the name, they never took a class or a course never took guitar lessons where the teacher taught them about music theory. They didn't look up what it's called or how it works or how it's applied. They, they think that I don't know any music, th that they don't know any music theory. Uh, and in fact, of course, as you just described, they do. They're just missing the labels. They just don't know how to verbalize what they do know. And then the other thing is if you, often those people are, are often the ones who think that by studying music theory, you would somehow be restricting yourself. So, and of course the whole time <laughs> they are, they do know some music theory, but if you ask them this question and here's where you, here's where you kind of trap them into this. If you ask them the question, okay, let's pretend that I'm not going to teach you any music theory terms. We're not going to have any courses or lessons or classes or books on music theory. But if you just take what you know, 
instinctively intuitive. It's not really instinct, but it's learned. But we'll use that term because that's what how they're thinking of it. Well, I just kind of know from experience how certain things go together. Certain notes and chords, they go together and they make certain sounds. Great. So if we just take what you know, and we add more to that. Don't worry, no music theory courses here, no jargon, no labels, no, no anything. We just get you to be able to do what you can already do, but much better and be able to recall it much faster. Would you like to do that? Would you like to get better at the things you're already good at? Almost everybody says yes to that question. And then I reply, great, you just signed up for some music theory lessons because that's exactly what we're that's exactly what is required here. If you want to do that, we're now going to attach labels to the things you know, and then we're going to expand upon what you know, because with this concept that you have in mind, you know the concept, you have a couple of different ways that you know how to use the concept. You can apply it this way, you can apply it that way, and sometimes you can apply it in this situation. Why don't we create something? Let me show you something that will show you all the ways that this same concept that you already know can be applied and all the doors just swing open. And like as I mentioned earlier, you have this feeling of liberation because now, oh, I don't even need to learn anything new. I can take what I already know and I've got 50 new ways that I can use it. And maybe from those 50, maybe 23 of those ways I really like. Maybe I don't like so much the other ones, but I, 23 is better than where I started when I only had two or three ways to use that. And I think if people see it that way, Maybe they're not so resistant to the idea of learning music theory or that it's restrictive or even that it's because they already know some stuff. They just don't know harmonic minor, as you know. Um, they may even know how to play it on the guitar because they've played that sound before. They're just altering a, <laughs> they're altering a Phrygian scale or whatever but they just don't know the name. They don't know it's the fifth mode of harmonic minor. They don't know what all of the chords are that go along with that, et cetera. So anyway, I think many people are not so far away from being able to learn this stuff. And that, which leads me to my next question. I'll, I'll ask you for your thoughts on this before I say mine. Um, what, do you, what do you see in your experience dealing with lots of students and people that you've taught uh, and do teach um, what happens typically when someone tries to learn music theory from many different places? They learn something from this. They learn something from a book. They take a little class or a course. Their guitar teacher mentions something. They, their friend tells them something. They looked up something on the internet. They kind of figured out a couple things on their own. And they, they comes from different places. What are your thoughts on that? You have her. <laughs> that's what i think so just i put my sorry, <laughs> i you, stick you, my you, neck out the, there you, you were muted the first couple of words you said you were still muted sorry I, I was saying that the learning music theory from too many sources especially on the internet is the worst thing ever okay I, i'm sticking my neck out there don't do that guys okay it's it's the worst thing ever because i mean maybe maybe Everybody that you read on the internet about music theory, or you watch the videos, or you follow, maybe every one of them is a great teacher. They know exactly what they're talking about. They know exactly how to explain. Maybe. Maybe not, of course. But let's say maybe they're all great teachers. Okay? But they're not teaching in exactly the same way. There are several approaches to you're music being very several... You're being very generous here. <laughs> I am, <laughs> but 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 again, let, let, let's give the benefit all the benefits of the doubt to everybody. Maybe they're great teachers. Maybe they know exactly what they're doing. But there are several entry points in music theory. Okay, I can start from here or from here or from here. I can give you a practical approach on the guitar, or I can give you a very practical approach on the piano. Those two approaches are completely not the same because I can play different things on those instruments. So wherever I start will be different. I will teach guitar play, um, music theory to a guitar player and music theory to a piano player in two completely different ways because what is easy on the instrument is different and what is typical of the instrument is different. At the end, both of them know everything, but the path inside music theory will be different. 
So here's the problem. You cannot follow two, three, seven, ten different paths. You're going to get confused. Okay, because this teacher explains you this part, this teacher explains you this part, this teacher explains you this part, another one explains you this part, and they're all disconnected, and then you got lost. If you just follow one, you will get to the end. Okay, and again, this, assuming everybody's great, and then online you find everything, the great and not so great, and <laughs> the best not even not even try, okay? Because that's that's how the internet is. Also, remember what we were saying before that different uh, there are different schools of music theory. We call the same thing in a different way. The, the biggest difference, for instance, between classical theory and jazz theory. Now, classical theory and jazz theory are not that different. They are the same mechanism under that, okay? Under the hood, we have the same engine. Why? Because we have only one pair of ears and one brain, okay? When you listen to classical theory and jazz, you don't switch your ears, you don't switch your classical ear for a pair of jazz ears, you listen with us in the same way. And music theory, more than a theory of sound, it's a theory of how your brain understand this sound. So the engine under that, it's the same, it's the same for classical, <clears throat> It's the same for jazz, it's the same for extreme metal, it's the same for avant-garde, it's the same for noise music. It's, you are listening with, in the same way. You may have there are different style of listening if you want, but give or take, your brain reacts in the same way to all this kind of music. Again, you may like it or not, but the mechanism is the same. But between classical theory and jazz theory, they give different names to the same thing. They notate things differently. They think about those things in, in different ways. Okay, like we were saying before, in counterpoint, you think about the melodies. When you start doing harmony, you think about the chords. In jazz, you start thinking about the chords. But for instance, one of the great things, why people like John Coltrane are considered great is because at a certain point in their career, they started thinking horizontally rather than vertically. Okay, many of the great solos of John Colton is when he started to say, okay, rather than thinking what I can do on a chord, why don't I think how I can play a melody that forms a kind of a counterpoint with what the bass is doing? And I know what the bass is doing because I know the chords. So there's all this kind of thinking back and forth between different directions. I'm simplifying a lot here. So if you're a John Colton fan, don't come at me. <laughs> I'm saying it's great <laughs> because he was doing also these and many other things. Okay. Same, by the way, for Charlie Parker. Um, and this is true for many other things. Okay, so if you're learning online and you're learning from some classical people that have a, a, people that have a classical education, people that have a jazz education, those people are going to talk about the same thing in completely different ways. And they're going to be confused because they're thinking, should I think of this thing this way or this other way or this other way? You can think about that in all the three ways, but you and you can learn all the three of them, but not at the same time. <laughs> okay, that's the thing. You, you have to learn them one at a time, and depending on the teacher, the order is different because some in, in their mind something is simpler and something is harder. And again, they can all be logically correct, but you cannot learn all those three or seven approaches at the same time. That will confuse you, okay? That's why to my students, for instance, I recommend uh, a diet, okay? And say, concentrate on the lessons I give you. Forget about the internet for a few months. Study this. Once you have it, great, go around. Find what's out there. Bring back new things, <laughs> not a problem. But first, learn the basics and learn the basics in the right way in an ordered way, in a systematic way, so that you actually understand. There is nothing in music like the feeling of actually knowing what you're talking about when you make music. Actually knowing that you have those things under your fingers, in your brain, you know how they sound, you know how to connect them, and you actually master this. And I know people will think that when they master these, they're going to get bored of these. And it's completely the opposite. You master these, you're going to have a lot, a lot, a lot more fun. Somebody who's had music theory can take three major chords and make them sound like heaven. 
because they understood everything about those three major chords and how to put them together and how to arrange them and, and all these kind of things. Okay. Let me ask you another question about this. Um, mm -hmm. and then we'll take a question from the chat here from people who are, who are uh, checking us out live. So one of the things that I find when teaching students, and I'm sure you find something similar with all the students you teach, is that a big part of teaching someone music theory who already knows something about it, but is, is confused or they don't really know what they think that they know is untangling the knot. When it's when a new student come, a new student gets to you, some of the aspects of music theory that they know may be correct, accurate, useful. Maybe they can apply it and integrate it. But other times they know bits and pieces, and this often, not always, but often comes because they've learned from various sources and they're coming from different angles. And it's just a big knot. And so our, my first job is to untangle the knot. Okay, and now let's build a foundation and build up from there. And I think for one such example is the modes. People trying to, and I know you have a course on exactly this topic, but people try to understand modes and they get confused because, well, wait a minute, uh, if I play a Dorian scale, I'm really in Dorian, right? Because I move, if, for example, if the song is in the key of C and they're basing their scale fingerings on the 10th fret or on the low E string and they play A, B, C, D, E, F, G starting from fret 10, they think I'm in Dorian now because I'm playing the Dorian mode. If the chord is C that's in the background, they're not playing the Dorian mode. doesn't matter where their fingers are. They're not in Dorian. Okay, they're in C major, but they'll swear, no, it's Dorian, because look, it starts on D, it ends on D, it's Dorian. So some people get confused that way because they don't fully understand when a fingering, they, they confuse the, the label of the fingering with the function of the notes as it's being played, which is determined by the chord more so than by the notes that are on top. Um, so that's one source of confusion that people get to. Another source of confusion is they is the opposite where they're thinking about each either they're thinking about each mode as its own key or everything is only an extension of the major scale and they're in c major even when playing a d dorian fingering even though there's no c chord in the whole in the whole track and they get confused about that uh, so it's a lot of this untangling the knots and then trying to uh, untangle that and then build from there so they can really not only learn and understand it, but then really use the theory that they know or are learning. What are your, what are your, what's your experience on that as a teacher? Well, first of all, on the mode things are completely right. And I, I blame the internet. When somebody started saying that uh, Dorian is the major scale starting from the second note, and that was the wrong verb, <laughs> okay, <laughs> because why it's not technically incorrect, it gives you the completely wrong idea about all that. Uh, there's something to be said about a clear explanation that it's not ambiguous. And this explanation is ambiguous and people got the wrong idea. And then people have started copying each other on these and then now the internet is full of things like the mods are just the major scale starting from these or to play Dorian, just play the major scale two frets down, which is the worst advice ever because again, Technically, you're that way of playing the right notes, but in practice, you're never going to be sounding good because you're not targeting the right notes, etc. So, okay, so that's the, that, that's, that's the first thing. It's, mm, I love the internet in general. We get much more information, we get, but at the same time, uh, it's hard, there's, there's little quality control in here, okay? And it's hard to tell who's right and who's wrong and, and, and why. And then you can try. You, you can sit down and figure out all those things by yourself and use your ears, but it's really hard to figure out something if you don't have any training or somebody guiding you at the same time, okay? I mean, nobody nobody will learn, for instance, how to drive a car by themselves or, I don't know, how to, how to do surgery by themselves. Okay, extreme example, I get it, but... Music theory is probably simpler than brain, than brain surgery, I assume at least, okay? But it's pretty hard to find your bearings if you don't know at least the basics, especially when they're confusing descriptions like 
uh, this one. Uh, sorry, to my, what was your question again after that? Because I wanted to comment on this and then I forgot your question. You well, the question, question was basically, you know, how do you how do you deal with students that have learned from multiple sources and that whether they learn from multiple sources or not, they're confused and they've got a knot basically that you've got to untangle because they what they know they don't know fully and they're missing pieces because maybe what they learned was out of order which almost always happens when you learn music theory from multiple sources at the same time uh and one of the but you know before i let you go on that one other thing that i wanted to comment on that's something you said was that um you mentioned that there are many people out there teaching theory on the internet who don't really have some people, not all, of course, some people, what they're saying is not correct. And that is out there. And you can find that on YouTube or anywhere, anywhere on the internet. There are people who are talking about music theory who probably really shouldn't be, but it's just not accurate. But there, there's another group of people who, what they are saying is accurate. They're not saying anything wrong or or, or bad or anything like that. They are on the right track and what they have to say is correct. But very often when these people tend to be more inexperienced as teachers, they don't, they, they, they're making factual statements about some aspect of music theory. But because they may not have taught thousands of people as you have and as I have, they, over many years, they don't, they can't project out or, or predict how will this piece of information be misunderstood in the 47 different ways that it's likely to be misunderstood in a group of 200 people. And when you just kind of throw it out there, uh, and, and sometimes people make the assumption that people are going to understand it in the way it was intended in complete context. And of course, there isn't context there. And I think that's where the even the bigger confusion comes when people, and whether they're learning you know, someone talking on the internet or they bought a course or something or whatever, even if the information is accurate from someone who does know what they're talking about, if that person hasn't really taught at least hundreds, if not thousands of people over many years, they're, they're very often not experienced enough as teachers of theory to know how it, all the different ways it could be misunderstood. So it, because if you know that, then you know you have to present that information differently because you already know, OK, if I say it this way, these people are going to think I really mean this. And those people are going to try and connect this with this and it doesn't connect or so on and so on. And maybe if you can comment on that as well. there is definitely an art in explaining things and uh, there is definitely the it, it's quite, quite quite a cliche actually that not all good musicians are good teachers i mean i know people like to say that the people people who cannot do teach uh no the, the people who teach are the ones who can do it and they also spend a lot of time trying to understand how to communicate that. <laughs> sorry okay that's why we have a distinction between performers and teachers, for instance. <laughs> I mean, okay, you can be a performer, you can be a teacher, you can be a composer, you can be a, be a critic, a music critic, you can be a pure theorist and all this kind of thing. But a teacher has a specific expertise and people who are mainly teacher or they spend a lot of their efforts trying to be teacher know these things better because our medium is not just music. Our medium is the mind of the student we weighed everything we say, thinking at how the student will understand what we say, what kind of conclusions he or she will take, what kind of connection he or she will do, and the kind of music that he or she will eventually go, write, go and write. A musician, will, a pure musician who, can, who has not taught before, will not do that. And, the, and the, a pure musician can give you perfectly correct information, but since it's not packaged the right way, it would be completely confusing, okay? And and you hit on, and sorry, you hit on something so profound, so profound that, that so I'm going to mute you for a second to avoid an echo. I'll unmute you in a minute. And I want to make sure that people didn't miss this because what Dr. Zilio said about 60 seconds ago is so huge. 
especially if you teach guitar. <laughs> okay, well, let me paraphrase, summarize and paraphrase what you said. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. So if I got any part of this wrong, correct me. But what was said was essentially many people who are not very experienced teachers of music theory, for example, but really of anything, um, their medium is music. They've got music or guitar playing or whatever, and the medium is the musical ideas or the guitar technique or whatever it is, and they're trying to now describe or explain the technique, the concept, the music, the, the theory, whatever it is. But what really experienced teachers, the, the best teachers, like Dr. Zidio here, for example, is their medium is not just music, it is the mind of the student. That is one of the most profound things ever stated by anyone ever anytime. That one statement is so massive because that's exactly what it is. It's not about, uh, see, if, when, if you go to university to learn how to teach, it's called uh, pedagogy. And if you go to learn that, you'll learn how you teach this and how you teach that. But you're going to learn almost nothing, very little about the mind of the student, at least with music pedagogy. And I, that was super, I didn't want to, I don't want you to say that and kind of just people didn't really pay attention. It's that, it's that important. All right. So I'll unmute you if you, if you want to continue on your thought there before we move and, on. Questions. And yes. And, and that's the thing. So, and again, I want to say, it's nothing wrong in being only a performer or only a composer or even only a teacher, okay? There's nothing wrong in any of that. People can decide to do whatever they want. But I mean, when I, when I want to listen to music, I go to a performer. When I want new music, I go to a composer. When I want to learn, I go to a teacher. <laughs> you go to the right person for the job. And I'm not even saying that one can be only one of those things. You could be a great composer and a great teacher. There have been people like that, okay? I mean, Beethoven, say, <laughs> okay, just to pick one, okay, or Bach, super famous because he was a good teacher too. Um, or you can be a great performer and a great composer and a great teacher, much more rare, okay, <laughs> or a great performer and a great teacher but not a great composer. You can have any kind of combinations, not a problem, okay. I mean, it's not strange that some people are, for instance, great composers but not great performers. And it's not even their fault sometimes. Um, for instance, Thomas, you, you you once introduced me to the planets by Holst. For people who don't know, later Google the planets by Gustav Holst, great piece of music. You, you know all the music because you've been using all the movies, you know, okay? Holst was a great composer. He was not a great performer, not because he was lazy, but because he has a nerve problem in his hands and he could not move his hands, okay? Uh, and so he composed and had other, other people write his, uh, perform his music to himself so he could correct it because he could not perform it himself. And it doesn't mean somebody is lazy. It means somebody has specific priority or specific constraint. Not a problem. Thing is, if you go to a performer, a pure performer, and trying to understand music, you, the student, are left to do all the job of decoding what they're doing, make sense of that, and reconstruct it. Is it impossible? No. Is it convenient? Not at all. <laughs> okay. You're going to go much, much, much further by going to somebody who already decomposed all the thing and can give you the principles and the ways to apply it. I mean, it's not even comparable. That's the thing. Now, you were asking how to deal with students who already have lots of knots and ties in their thinking. One way is to have a long chat with them and try to find those doors. I found that in some situations, and actually most of the situation, the best way is to have, it's going to sound bad, but hear me guys. The best way is to start from scratch and go to the basics really fast. A lot of people are very resistant to start starting from scratch. Every time I manage to convince somebody to restart from scratch, a few weeks later, they thank me. They're like, now everything is clear. Everything I learned before is clear too. They were missing just a little thing at the very beginning. Okay. From a student point of view, there is nothing worse than th saying, I know this already. And again, I know, guys, I know how this sounds. Okay. I know people are going to thinking, no, I really don't want to go and relearn the basic. 
I even learned the basic several, several times. Every time I go through the basics, there's something new that I find. <laughs> it's, it is a ball in music and it makes me better. Okay. That's really, it's really not, not a problem. And people, I think, underestimate how much power there is in the basics. In the basics. Okay. People underestimate how much music is made with very simple basic element only used with a certain amount of art. Okay. That's the best way. Restart from the basic. Don't be afraid to restart from the basic. It's the fastest way to get the advanced things. If your basics are not solid, there is no way you're going to be able to understand or use advanced concept. If your basics are solid, you're going to burn through the whole thing very fast and learn everything. You're going to learn like wildfire, okay, if you, if you know your basics, okay? Some people, again, are resistant because they want to learn the super advanced concept, uh, inverse triton substitution, negative harmony, etc., which are, they're super fun, I'm not saying no, okay? But you're not going to be able to use them unless you know the basics, okay? That's the idea. Um, that's the best way to untangle all, all these. The problem of those tangles and knots is that you cannot see them in yourself. I know I could not see them in myself. <laughs> I never was confused for the longest time. I know the first four basic harmony book I read, they were wasted. I mean, I didn't understand anything. I reread them later. <laughs> okay. You can imagine how much time it took. Okay. But at the beginning, I didn't get anything. I thought I could. I couldn't. Okay. That's, it's not a question of how intelligent or smart you are. It's not a question of how perseverant you are. It's a question that there are missing, that is missing information. Books of music theory have been written to be used in the classroom where there is a teacher explaining you. So now it's the quality of the teacher, not so much the quality of the book. So it's really the quality of the person teaching you. One thing I found is this, is that you may have a lot of teachers in your life. But you're going to find that you're going to learn 95 to 98 percent of what you're going to actually use from one person. Because, because the moment you find the good one, you stay with him. That's the thing. Yeah, great point the about important. the textbook. You know, when, when people get the textbook and they. It's like getting the book for a class and never showing up to the class. Can you learn some things that way? Yeah, you can learn some things that way, but you're, you're missing the most important part. It would be better to class without the book than to read the book without the class most of the time. Some uh, questions here. Uh, There's a question on Facebook. Uh, what should a multi-instrumentalist do who is taking lessons from several instructors at once? For example, a piano teacher, a guitar teacher, etc. cetera. Um, and is learning theory from all of them at the same time. Is that going to be problematic? That's the question and I'll I'll put that to you. I know we kind of partially answered this already. What are your thoughts on that? It is potentially problematic because a piano player and a guitar player have two com completely different approach to music. Um, in general, when you when you learn theory, there are three main approach to music theory, the, the, the piano approach, the guitar approach and the voice approach, and they are completely different. And you want to learn all of them eventually. <laughs> if, I mean, you can. Uh, they're all really good. They will give you, they're all complete. Okay. It's the voice is, um, it's harder to make, make chords with the voice, but you can, um, by, by singing our pages, <clears throat> learning them at the same time, it's potentially problematic. So in this case, if you really, really, really want to do it, if you, I mean, if you are really set on learning everything at the same time, I would advise to first try to keep things separate. So think of what they teach you in piano as piano theory and think of what they teach you for guitar as guitar theory. Again, that's not te technically correct. Th there is music theory and it can be applied to instruments, but the approach is so different. The mindset is so different that you are better off thinking of this as two different versions of music theory. And then later, once you are a few years in, probably let's say a couple of years in, just to give it a, a, a time frame, which is, of course, approximate, then you can start to translate stuff from one instrument to another and see how it works. But let's say 
it's still something that I would not recommend. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, uh, you, you're, you're, you're picking these suggestions out of me. I really don't want to give them. <laughs> okay. I will learn one thing and then the other. Okay. And uh, it's in this case, probably quality over quantity. It's not true for everything, but in this case, probably quality over quantity. I will learn one instrument really well. Okay. Yeah. And the theory relative to, to it. And then I will learn the other um, instruments, theory and approach. Remember that you can do music with any of them. I mean, for instance, most classical players were trained in piano, when most of the classical composers were trained in piano. So the most of their music, you can hear the piano under the orchestra in a sense, even if the, 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 there's no piano, you can hear the approach. But if Hector Berlioz, for instance, was a guitar player, not a piano player, he actually took pride on not being able to play the piano, and his music is completely different and still really, really good. You may like it or not, but... Okay, and let uh, most of rock, blues, metal, country, <laughs> okay, pop, it's composed on guitar, and you can hear the guitar in there. Um, even when they write piano parts, you can hear the guitar. And again, is that good? Is not that good? It's it's what it is. I may like it. I may not like it depending on, on the implementation. But learn one thing well. Learn one thing well and make it work. And then it's easier to make other thing work. That would be my approach, but. All right, how about this question here, uh, Dr. Zivio? What percentage uh, what of time should be ah. spent on exercises versus repertoire? Any thoughts on that? Okay, um, <clears throat> several. <laughs> it really depends on you and your goals. Um, if you just started learning guitar, for instance, I would spend most of my time on exercise and theory and just a little bit on repertoire because you just don't have the tools to learn a lot of songs yet. On the other hand, if, for instance, you have a show in a few weeks, uh, I would spend most of my time learning the show and rehearsing the show rather uh, than learning new thing or doing exercise, or I will make an exercise out of those songs so if they are technical. Uh, difficult parts. Okay, I mean, if if in two weeks you have to play a, a gig and it's it's only dream theater songs, uh, rehearsing that it's also a technical exercise. Okay, so it really depends on your goal at the time and what you need to do at the time. But since I know you guys want an idea, I will I will split my time in four. Uh, twenty-five percent of my time will be. I mean, again, that, that's if I, if I if I have no particular goals and no particular shows coming up. And but twenty-five percent of my time will be for physical technique. Twenty-five percent of my time will be in expressive technique. So phrasing, slides, bend, vibrato, all this kind of thing, making things sounds good. One fourth, that twenty-five percent will be theory, which will be still on the instrument. So like finding chords, making, creating chord progression, finding scale, learning all this kind of thing that tells you what to play, not just, not just playing. And remaining 25% will be either improvising or uh, learning repertoire. That will be a starting point. It's a good place to start. And then you can adjust from there exactly. based upon what, you know, based upon what the goals that one has. Are. Okay, let's take another question here. It's not clear to me who it's meant for, me or you, even though it says Tom. All my friends call me Tom Hess. None of my friends call me Tom. And Dr. Zelio's first name, Tommaso, uh, his wife calls him Tom. So <laughs> I'm not sure who it's meant for. But uh, let's see. What's your opinion about learning guitar or theory for sources like the internet? And I think we've kind of touched on that already. There are... There are some people, I basically put people in the, on the internet in three groups. There are people who, and you can, Tommaso, if you have a different opinion on this, you, please go ahead and jump in. Um, there are people who, not really great sources of music theory knowledge, who talk about music theory on the internet. Okay, even some fairly well-known ones. Okay, well, I'm not gonna mention names here, but there are people in that group. And then there's a second, people in the group, a second group, which is the, the most dangerous, which is that people who, who do have, as I said before, they do have correct information. They, they, they do know their music theory. 
All right. And what they're saying is accurate and true, it, but it may be out of order. It may be out of context and they may not have the experience in knowing how things can be misunderstood, how people can take the information and then try to integrate it with other things and they, and they get this wrong. Um, that, that's the people who don't know what they're talking about. You'll kind of figure that out as you learn more. You'll kind of figure that out on your own. OK, you won't need someone to point it out. But it's that second group where there's a lot of confusion. And then people get all their music theory knowledge and a knot, and then we got to go on more than the other two. Do know what they're talking about. We've got a lot of experience teaching music theory and students generally. Um, and they're very aware of the order in which information is presented and then how to break it down in a way where it's less likely to be misunderstood or misapplied or attempts of integration um, cause more harm than good. Any, anything to add to that, Dr. Steele? I agree with your three-part division of teachers on the internet. And I'm adding that the, the third group, and not, not only how to explain it so that it's simpler, clearer, etc., but also uh, people in the third group tend also to explain to you how to use these things in practice. Everybody can tell you that the C major chord is C E G. But what do you do with that? What kind of music do you do with that? What are creative ways of using the C major chord? How would we think about this course so that we can make creative music? Okay. Um, I think it was the composer Terry Riley that said that there is so much good music still to be written in C major. <laughs> okay. And Terry Riley wrote a piece called In C, which is interesting at least <laughs> okay and which is only in c major and hey he made he made the c major scale really work for him <laughs> okay so it's actually i think one of the distinguishing thing is that people in the in your third group the people who can actually explain are not afraid to go back to basics while the people in the second group do only advanced things they never go back to basics or when they explain the basics, you're looking at them and like, uh, this is co actually confusing, <laughs> not really, not really, not really helpful. So I say you want to learn on the Internet, start to notice when you are confused. When you are confused, it's probably not you. <laughs> OK, I mean, it may be, but it's probably not you. That's the thing. There's all the good and all the bad on the Internet. And it's it's hard to give guidelines now to distinguish the two things unless you know it already. So it's just beware. That, that that's that's the that's advice. Beware. Yeah. Good good thoughts there. All right. One last question we'll take from the chat here. I'm a classically trained. I'm classically trained in theory, but my compositions sound classical, but not in the way I'd like. Any ideas for unlearning some of this? Or do I learn more? I definitely have thoughts on that. If you, but if you want to take a crack at this first, well, uh, the first thing will be to define how do you want to sound. If you don't want to sound classical, start defining how you want to sound. And it's a good idea to take a few examples. Okay, so we want to sound jazz, pop, country. How do you want to sound? Find people that at least approximate the way you sound. And then you either find a teacher that can teach you that. You go straight to the teacher and say, I want to sound like those people. Can you do it? And hope the, the teacher is honest, of course. But I want to sound like those people. Can you do it? And uh, or, uh, or you try to reverse engineer everything. But that's a couple of decade worth of work. OK, reverse engineering something in a different style. Uh, people like to imagine it's easy. It's really not. <laughs> OK, there's lots of work to be done because especially if you were classically trained, you tend to look at specific things in music and maybe that music is built on other things. Um, to make it less vague, you tend to look at, at chord progression, voice leading, etc., which are all good things. But maybe other, uh, that other music is built on rhythm, not on, uh, on chord progressions per se. OK, to make an extreme example, if you want to if you want to write rap songs 
starting from the chords is the wrong approach. <laughs> okay, you have to just start with the rhythm and get and get that rhythm down. If you want, okay, if if you want to learn jazz, the rhythm is a big part of that. Very big. I'm surprised how all the jazz book books on music theory explain only harmony when the, a lot of it is melody and rhythm and there's very little explaining that in there. Um so you want to sound different, find somebody who can teach you what's different and then approach the teacher the right way. The teacher has something to teach you, be ready to throw away what you know already and learn the new thing so you can sound different. After all, if you keep doing the same thing, you're going to sound the same, so something has to change, <laughs> okay? So that would be the thing. Um, and remember that what you know, what you, what you know already, it's not the whole story. And, and this is true for everybody. It's true for me. What I know already, it's not the whole story. If you come in my office, I have a big pile of music theory books just there. Okay. And I'm going through all of them. Again, after all, it's my job. Okay. I, I would not recommend this to anybody, uh, but I find it fun for me. <laughs> and it's, for most people going through music theory book and trying to decipher them, uh, and decipher them and understand them, it's it's a pain. So I would not recommend that. Um, for me, it's fun. And notice that some of those music theory books are not even in English. <laughs> okay, and some of, some of the best music theory books are in French and they've been written 150 years ago. They're not really up to date, but there are great ideas in there. <laughs> okay, and by the way, classical French, not modern French, so not exactly the easiest of languages. I happen to know some, some French, so I can read them. Um, I never found a, a good music theory book in Italian, incidentally. <laughs> Just so, but, um, so, if you really, 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 really like reading music theory books and spending your afternoons doing that and you don't have to, wor to work in other places, and sure, do it. But if you want to make music, just bypass all that. Go to somebody that can teach you that. Okay, it could be me, it could be the man, it could be somebody else. Okay, and so I'm not saying uh, everybody has to come to us. Okay, but find somebody who you think explains in a clear way. Find somebody who can explain you how to sound good in the style or in the kind of music you want to play, or at least can give you some elements of that. What were your thoughts, Thomas? Great. Uh, well, first of all, uh, what you said was really good. I mean, I, I, agree with all of that stuff. I would just add one little other piece, or really maybe two. If you look historically on um, how music, when music theory was developed, we mentioned Rameau earlier, Dr. C there mentioned Rameau, you know, when prior to that, it wasn't that composers didn't study what other composers before them were doing. Of course they did, just like people today look at what other songwriters are doing and try to learn lessons from that, whether they're taking actual lessons or classes or not. All right. But the point is that if you look throughout history, we've got the, you know, the, the Renaissance era and then the Baroque era and then the classical era, there's a big difference in how music theory concepts were applied in the classical era versus the era before the Baroque era. And then if you jump ahead to the Romantic era, 1820s through 1900 or so, the all of the music theory concepts that were used then were expanded from what came before. Now, when if you're, it sounded like the person who asked this question um, is taking classes at a university or a college of some kind. And as you go through that program, right, the first semester you're going to basically learn. Bach, the first, whole first semester is going to be Bach music theory. It's basically going to be one guy because he's the most single most important person who ever lived in all of music is J.S. Bach. That's why the whole first semester is basically just that one guy. All right. And then, so you're going to learn all about four part chorale writing. You're going to learn all the basic counterpoint rules, the four laws of motion, all of those you know, between notes, all of those sorts of things. And then in the second semester, you get to Mozart, Haydn, early Beethoven, th that general era. Okay. And you're going to learn more about things that you'll, you'll learn about secondary dominance, which things like that, which Bach also used, but you, you start building from there. And then in the third semester, you're likely to encounter Schubert and Franz Liszt and Chopin. Those are the giants of the era and then later Brahms and maybe up to Wagner and so on. But the point is that in all of the era, eras that you study, okay, and 
the music theory as it advances from one semester to the next in the university. You're going to see examples of how music composers' use of theory evolved. And then, of course, theories had to be uh, worked out to determine what was happening and, and why the music worked the way that it did. So the point is, if you're writing right now and, and the music that you were composing sounds like Haydn and Mozart, if that's what you mean when you say classical, which would be the strict definition of classical music. Um, if you look a little bit later, Schubert, Beethoven, and then, you know, Schumann, uh, Chopin, Franz Liszt, those guys in the first half of the 19th century, you're going to find that they don't sound like Mozart and Haydn, okay, that, or, or Bach. Um, they don't sound. And when you get later into Mahler, Wagner, Brahms, they again don't sound like the generation before. So the point is, the more you learn, the more doors open up, okay? So even within the classical world, as you go through the different eras, you see how music theory concepts were expanded and applied in different ways to create completely different styles. All right, now, to a common person's ears, it all might seem like classical. Some people can't distinguish the difference between Bach and Wagner. Hard to believe, but the, <laughs> there are people who can't really tell. It's all classical to them, all right, even though technically neither one was in the classical era. Funny, funny enough. Uh, but the point is that there's a lot to learn from each era and you can, whether it's counterpoint stuff and polyphony in the Baroque era, or it's the stretching of tonality to its absolute maximum with Wagner. Um, there is so much to learn there. I think, so your question was, should you start unlearning things or learn more? The answer is always learn more. I mean, that that's, I suppose like we could have answered this in one sentence. Yes, more, learn more, learn more. But there's one other piece I want to add to this, and then we'll, I think we'll wrap up here. And this goes back to what we were talking about with music theory being a set of rules, or not being a set of rules, essentially. I view music theory this way. The, for me, the whole purpose of music theory, why it exists, why I would even bother learning about it studying it, going, using it, integrating it, is because music theory is the only thing that can tell you with a very high degree of accuracy what something will feel like emotionally before you even touch your guitar. Only music theory can do that. If you want to know very specifically, what exact specific emotion you want to create on the guitar. If you don't have music theory knowledge, you can't do that. All you can do is trial and error. You're just guessing. You're just letting your fingers play little phrases and wander around and experiment. And maybe some of it's going to sound okay. Maybe some of it's not going to sound so good. But if you want to reliably, 100% of the time, pinpoint exactly the emotion you want to express from note to note or from chord to chord, from moment to moment, only music theory can give you that. So for me, that is my number one, in fact, really my only goal as a musician for myself. I want to express exactly what I want to express. I'm not interested in anything else. I'm not interested, for, for me, I mean, everyone has their own goals, but for me, I'm not interested in playing like so-and-so or writing songs that sound like whoever. I'm only interested, I've got things I want to express and I want to be as accurate at being able to express those emotions on and be reliable doing that. That's my only goal. So for me, music theory is everything because it, it's the tool that I'm going to use to do that on a reliable basis. So if that, if, if you, if you share at all in any part of what I said, if you share that goal at all, music theory is critically important. It's the fastest, most reliable way to get you to that point. So, all right, Dr. Zidio, you want to jump in real quick? Yeah, wait, yeah, yes. That is one thing because this come back to what you were saying the music theory made of rules okay the the most one of the most famous rules to music theory is that you should never use parallel fifth i'm not going to explain the whole technical thing it's a thing that 
you go in, in, in and learn classical music, classical theory, that's the first thing they tell you. Right? No, don't use parallel fifths. You can use parallel fifths, just not in classical music. Modern music is full of parallel fifths. In practically every pop song, you can find a parallel fifth. We like parallel fifths. They sound like candy to your ears. Is they just not in style for the classical Baroque music? Even if Mozart used a couple, but they're just not in style for that. So it's not a rule, okay? It's if you want to sound like that, then do it. If you want to sound like this, do it. It's not a rule, you guys see. It's a guideline. If you, if you like your house painted of a specific color, do that. Nobody says that you cannot paint your house bright red. It's not a rule, but most houses are not painted bright red, okay? Most classical music does, does, doesn't have parallel fifths. It's the same kind of thing. It's a taste thing. It's a style thing. The material is the same. Um, several... The, the intervals in music have been the same forever, but the kind of intervals and how we use them in an emotional way in music changed during, during time, and knowing that, you can create your own style. Music theory is not just looking at the past. Music theory is also looking at the future. You see what, the, what people have done in the past, and you start thinking about this in a different way and thinking, People have never done that before. Why don't I try? <laughs> okay. Maybe you discover why they never have done that before because it's horrible. But sometimes you discover something new, and those parallel fifths are definitely in there. I have a video coming in a few weeks about uh, songs with parallel fifths. <laughs> you don't even notice there's a parallel fifth. I mean, unless you, you have very good ears. But they are there. There are there are pop songs they completely built on parallel fifths, meaning that the melody in the verse and the chorus is a parallel fifth with the bass all throughout the song. You know them, they are famous, <laughs> okay, I'm not spoiling the surprise. And they sound great. Hey, so, when people tell you about the parallel fifths, it's not a rule, <laughs> it's a style, okay? There are no rules in music theory. Thank you for that, Tommaso. So, Tommaso, you have a free resource that people can check out. You want to just tell us about that real quick? Yes, definitely. And uh, we were talking about before uh, how we need to know the basics the right way. This is a very short, free ebook that gives you a few of the basics, most of the basics on music theory, how it applies on guitar. It's very short. If you guys know something about music theory, you're going to work through it very fast. If you know nothing, that's the right starting point for you. And it explains in a clear way things I have not found explained in a clear way anywhere else. I'm not saying this to say that I'm the only intelligent one. I'm just saying I haven't found it, so I wrote it. And you're probably going to find it useful. So. If you have any doubt, even if you think you know your music theory, why don't you go through this book? If you really know your music theory, you are done with the book in a few minutes. And if nothing else, you can be sure that now you're, you're sure that you know what you're talking about. And if you don't, you may learn something new and this could make your music different. Very cool, Tommaso. Thank you for that. I also have a resource, uh, Guitar Mastery Decoded, it's called. And this is for people who want to sort of demystify what it takes to master guitar. I mean, there are a certain set of principles that people who have mastered guitar have followed. They may have applied the principles in slightly different ways or in different proportions, but it's not a big mysterious thing that you can't do or you have to be born with a certain set of skills and if you weren't if you didn't win the dna lottery you, you can't do it or that some people think you've got to practice your guitar for eight hours a day for the whole your whole life and then uh because they hear stories of people who claim to have done that and that uh well, there are people who played the guitar for many years and many hours a day and maybe they didn't have efficient ways to get to where they wanted to get to the point is that if you want to sort of decode guitar mastery, you can download this free resource. It's totally free; doesn't just doesn't cost anything, and you can uh, out at your leisure. Doctor Zilio, 
thank you for being here. I'd like to thank all of our, our guests here, our viewers here who were uh, watching us live here and who will watch this later on in the recordings. Thank you, Dr. Zilio, for all sharing your, your uh, knowledge and wisdom very generously. Appreciate it very much. Thank you, Tomas. And uh, thank you for having me here. It was a pleasure. It's, it's always nice to talk with you, honestly. <laughs> we know each other. It's always nice to talk with you, but it's been good to, to have this, this chat in front of this audience. And uh, I hope that in people in the audience found something useful about all of that. If you found something useful, guys, just 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 write in the comments or the chat what you find useful so we know and so we can do more about all of that. And thank you everybody. Thank you, Dr. Cedio. Thank you everybody.